Great talk, uh, John. Uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Olufemi Ayeni. He's from uh, Canada, uh, from McMaster University. He's an expert in evidence-based medicine. He has an interest in hip arthroscopy, FAI, and I had a chance to work closely with him on some uh, work. So uh, it's a pleasure to have him come and talk to us this morning about uh, the diagnosis of hip pain in athletes and his approach. So thank you all for your attention today, and I bring you best regards from Canada. I also thank Dr. Philippon for putting together what I consider a dream team of uh, hip experts. I'm just lucky to be on the bench and hanging on here. Um, certainly in 15 minutes, I can't change your diagnostic paradigm on hip arthros on hip uh, diagnosis, but I want to leave you with two things. One, the current state of the evidence, and then number two, having you uh, understand at least my approach, evidence-based on diagnosing a patient with hip problems. And so the question, or my spin on this talk is, diagnosis of hip pain in athletes, and specifically, is there an evidence-based approach, and is it needed in this particular scenario? So here my disclosure is not relevant to this talk. And why bother with the evidence? First question, well, surgeons and therapists in this room, I know, aim to give the best care for patients. And in 2014, athletes specifically are very sophisticated, they're very informed, and they have rapid access to technology. And in a matter of a few clicks, they can know exactly what's going on with their hip. So just a show of hands, how many of you have patients who instantly told you about their YouTube experience before seeing you and what they're about to undertake with their surgeries and whatnot and their rehab and what to do and how you're going to treat them, how many anchors? Exactly. So in order to um, really evaluate this information on YouTube, Dr. Philippon and I collaborated in a study um, taking a systematic approach and assessing information on that website. So in short, we know we have 100 million plus views with regards to YouTube, and we applied our systematic techniques that we have seen in the literature directly to this uh, condition. We had limits in English and also, but no time limits, and we were able to glean out 52 videos on the first three search pages because we figured out after three pages, people tend not to go beyond that. So you can get the full details of our methodology in this publication just a few months ago. But in short, we had our you know, usual abstraction of data, removing duplicates and moving down our paradigm steps here. And you can see what the results were in brief. So on our 16-point checklist, with 16 out of 16 being perfect and zero being essentially not good at all, you can see the skew on the x-axis and on the y-axis number of studies. Green, sorry, blue is for diagnostic studies uh, and red for treatment studies. And again, you can get a sense that most um, publications or videos, rather, on YouTube skew to the left side of the um, graphic, showing that most patients have access to a lot of information, but not good information. Also, surprisingly, when it comes to who's disseminating the information, about two-thirds are health professionals. So it may look as if they're getting good information, but in reality, they are not. So I think that we've also looked at the sources and quality of information addressing FAI, and we can see a dramatic rise um, with regards to the publications, but again, level four, level five type evidence, and most of it by orthopedics. And so we do need to beef up the evidence and strengthen our approach and resolve in trying to provide patients with best of care. So when it comes to differential diagnosis of hip pain, knowing that we have limitations in our evidence, how do we diagnose hip pain? Some people will talk about static dynamic causes. Others will talk about, you know, uh, intra-articular, extra-articular hip mimickers. But rather than give you um, a specific approach or critique one or the other, I can tell you I use the anatomic approach. Hip pain can be musculoskeletal, genitourinary, gynecological, neurologic, and abdominal. So there are many sources of hip pain. And for this specific conference, when I was invited to um, present this specific topic, two months ago we started a systematic review, and I hope we can recruit Dr. Holmich and Adam as well to help us out downstream for publication, and ask the specific question. In athletes undergoing surgical intervention, secondary to groin pain, what are the commonest reported clinical diagnoses and diagnostic procedures? We searched three search engines a couple months ago, and here are our results, preliminary results. We had 3,500 studies to review, and 83 were included. You can see our screening and abstraction data with excellent agreement. And moving forward, in summary, again, incomplete, fresh data, general physical examination was reported to be a crucial step as far as diagnosis in most cases, and the commonest cause of surgical indicated surgery in the athlete was sports hernias, but when you look at the intra-articular hip conditions, labral tears and FAI, they account for 30%. So as a category, that was the most common cause uh, of 
uh, patient or an athlete specifically requiring surgery. So let's talk about history. Well, <clears throat> classically the C sign, a patient will cusp his or her uh, hands around the hip girdle and complain about discomfort deep in the joint. But I think this all goes back to therapy school or medical school, right back to the basics. When you see a patient and they ask, talk about their pain, you ask them about the pain onset, quality, radiation, dur duration, triggers, etc. So just breaking it down to the basics and asking where the pain is coming from will give you a lot of information. Secondarily, this paper has been presented here as well. Clohissi has shown that most patients will present with groin dominant discomfort, at least if they have a diagnosis of FAI. And referencing it with his gold standard, 88% of patients had groin dominant discomfort and 67% with lateral pain. There's certainly other ways to present, but these are the commonest ways to present with hip uh, discomfort in the athlete. Examination again. I think Dr. Tan has made an excellent point recently that you can't be dogmatic, but you can be systematic. So you start with a standing approach assessing gait and alignment, a seated approach for your straight leg raise neurovascular check. Your supine examination is the workhorse for range of motion symmetrically, testing side to side differences, and then finally moving on to your provocative tests, and then your lateral decubitus and prone examination to round up your exam. You can see I can again in 15 minutes change your physical examination strategy, but I can at least give you a systematic approach and talk about some of the evidence around it. So we have seen this paper as well, I believe in this conference by Thiessen, the group from Netherlands showing that our physical examination evidence needs to get better. Um, <clears throat> clearly the studies that are out there um, are of low quality evidence and don't reference the gold standard in, in, in uh, many cases. And so there's work to be done. But despite that um, room for uh, pessimism, there is room for optimism. Dr. Uh, Philippon was involved in this study uh, with Ha Martin and the group. And when you brought together and again, for details, you can refer to the reference. When you brought together six expert uh, surgeons or uh, individuals who treat patients with hip pain, there was a common thread. They found important tests that they all did, mind you, a little bit differently, but when they came together, there was enough commonality in these tests to recommend a battery of physical examination maneuvers to pursue. And those included flexion range of motion, flexion internal and external rotation, supination, um, supine, sorry, um, testing of range of motion, and deflection, adduction, internal rotation, typically called the impingement test. So common maneuvers, standing, you're checking for their standing cadence, seeing if they have a pelvic drop. You move on to your physical examination in supine position with rotational movements and straight leg raising. Of course, the anterior impingement test, which is very varied in prone and supine positions. You can test both anterior and posterior structures, and then you check your version in the prone positioning. Again, I know everybody here, this is a very sophisticated audience, so I'm not about to change your physical examination skills, but at least tell you what I do in practice. We also evaluated the squat test because the critique was, you know, you're doing these static tests, just moving it once in one plane or two plane movements. Perhaps a more dynamic test will give us more information. But again, our evaluation of 676 patients with FAI has shown that, although somewhat sensitive, not very specific, and the predictive values are quite low for CAM type FAI. So moving forward, you have many diagnostic modalities. You have your x-rays, your MRI with arthrogram, your CT scan, your ultrasound, your diagnostic injection. So where do you go moving on on an evidence-based approach? Well, I'll refer you to this resource. To look at the x-rays, how to do the x-rays, conduct them, how to evaluate the x-rays, I would say this is a very good resource to take a look at and read and save if you're seeing the patient population, especially in athletes, rather than going through every single sequence of what you'll find in an x-ray for with an athlete who has or presents with hip pain. That being said, a well done x-ray as you can see in the top is an AP pelvis with symmetrical obturator for Raymond's, teardrops are even and adequate space between the coccyx and the symphysis pubis. When you look at the alpha angle, arguably the most commonly reported um, radiographic outcome measure in CAM type impingement, you see a femoral head and neck bulge with loss of offset and you draw that by bisecting the head and um, <clears throat> bisecting it with the exit point of the, of the uh, bony bump, so to speak. The crossover sign is when the antilateral wall uh, crosses over the posterior wall. And of course, the MR arthrogram is very helpful because it gives you a sense of cartilage damage, labrum damage, increasingly capsule and ligamentum, and ligamentum teres damage. The CT scan we tend to use in revision settings or complex cases because of radiation exposure, but it can be very helpful. And you do have subtraction techniques you can utilize to really define the rim or the femoral head and neck junction. So who makes the correct diagnosis? You know, we've all had that scenario, I'm sure, you know, Dr. Philippon, et cetera, where a patient comes in and says, you know what, I had an x-ray done and everything is normal, or an athlete, and then you take that same x-ray and you look at it and it's not normal. So who makes the correct diagnosis? Do we trust the radiologists 
or do we trust the orthopedic surgeons? And this is Dr. Philip Hernandez's course in Vail last year. So we did evaluate this at McMaster University, recently published as well. We had 50 consecutive patients with FAI present with their x-rays. We gave them to three MSK radiologists and three orthopedic surgeons. And we said, okay, you tell us what you see based on these six parameters. Well, we see different things. The radiologists agree to themselves, the orthopedic surgeons themselves, but interspecialty reliability, very low. And so I was talking to Dr. Sargent today. I think it's very important that when you have a patient and they're visiting your clinic or your center, try and put together a congruent strategy so that your radiology team and your orthopedic team agree on the diagnosis of FAI, morphology, and whatnot that you may have in your patient population. So I think despite that, pay attention to your cartilage status. The paper by McCarthy has been very helpful in showing that acetabular cartilage loss or femoral cartilage loss, as you can see in the survivorship cur curves, are critical things to evaluate because they predict just how long your hip will last for before it fails. And you can see the top lines represent minimal cartilage damage, grade zero, grade one, and the bottom line shows failure rates of 50%, and these are more significant uh, cartilage damaged uh, patients. Dr. Philippon has done this work as well, evaluating joint space loss and failure rates. And at 40 months, if you have less than two millimeters of joint space uh, or significant narrowing, your failure rates approach 86%. So diagnostic hip injection is next, so you've moved through your history, your physical examination, you've done your imaging, and now you've moved on to your diagnostic hip injection. Well, we know from Dr. Bird's study that um, <clears throat> is 90% accurate in diagnosing intraarticular hip conditions, and a paper by Kivlin et al. has also shown that post hoc, mild cartilage damage, or the amount of cartilage damage you have in your joint, tends to predict just how much relief you obtain from your hip injection. However, one of the questions we tend to ask or people ask is, is that injection predictive? Meaning, in many cases, people will say, if I have groin pain and I've had an injection and my pain goes away, does that mean I will have a good outcome from surgery? Well, we did this evaluation at McMaster as well. We had 52 prospective patients with FAI diagnosed um, radiographically, and they obtained an intraarticular injection by the same radiologist using the same standardized technique you can see the injected materials and the all documented pain relief and were instructed to challenge their hip for at least two weeks. So we, mod we uh, documented their preoperative and six month outcomes and modified higher hip scores, dichotomized their outcomes, success, no success based on convention at 70. And essentially what we found was this. You can see our likelihood ratios calculated from our sensitivity and specificity. And in short, if you had a positive hip injection, meaning you had pain relief, it didn't predict your outcomes, particularly at six months, but if you had no benefit from an intraarticular injection, you had a higher likelihood of having a negative outcome at six months. Now, these results have been tested again at one year, and they still hold up, and we'll do that at two years again and get full follow-up, and I anticipate they'll hold up again. So a negative response from injection, meaning you get no relief, can predict a higher likelihood of a negative outcome with hip arthroscopy for FAI surgery. And this has been for more details on methodology published as well in KSSTA. So is the evidence helpful? I would say yes. In athletes as well as in other patients, a well-conducted history, physical examination, adjunct imaging, and a diagnostic hip injection can provide you with enough detail and enough to make a diagnosis that's accurate in the athlete with hip pain. Thank you.